Hello everyone, this is G and I'm back with a new video, or with the uh, fourth video I should say, of the He-Man, uh, rather say, Masters of the Universe episode review. This is the f uh, fourth episode, there's five in total, one more left. So, this episode um, is the one where they go to uh, Subternia, where they go to hell to retrieve half of the sword, right? Half of the sort of power. And um, it's not a terrible episode, though again, Tila is painfully annoying. But it does have its good points. First of all, the best part is uh, the art. The lighting, the shadows. A lot of time in the episode, obviously, is spent on Tila facing her fears. And she's has to deal with um, Skelegod here. But oh my god, this... The lighting, especially in Tila's scenes with uh, Skelegod early in the episode, the lighting and the shadows and the colors, beautiful. The art continues to be one of one of the very very few strong elements of this show, consistently strong. I may not agree with designs as we as I've said, right? But oh my God, just the lighting, the colors, the animation is is solid it's met but like just the art style the company did an amazing job i hear it's the same company that did the castlevania anime good job y'all great job and a standout in the episode is um orko right this is orko's last stand and again the the voice actor for uh orko does an amazing job um with him it's it, his, his 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 work is very emotional right and you learn a, a lot about orko because interestingly enough the the quiet scene that's been needing to happen between two characters in in this show finally does happen but it happens between evil lynn and orko right but they're both mages so even though they're on opposite sides there's actually a lot that um they can relate to uh, with the with each other. So to uh, summarize what happens, basically, they start out um, in hell, right? And they quickly uh, end up getting separated. Tila ends up alone dealing with Skelegod, um, uh, Orko, and uh, Evil Lynn end up I think at the Academy of Magic or something. The scenery, honestly, especially for the Academy of Magic, is beautiful. And then you have um, Andra, Ro Andra Ro Roboto, and I think it's the Beastman. It's more or less sort of like a like a companion or a bodyguard to uh, Evil Lynn. He hasn't really done much of any any value in the series. I guess uh, he's sort of like well, like I can't even com compare him to Andra. Because he's he's definitely a much more cynical, much more experienced character, and Andra's not even really there to protect um, uh, Tila. She even says, and I think it's in episode two, that she's the brains of the operation, and Tila is the brawn. So they definitely are partners in their in their um, uh, mercenary work, while. Um, the beast man seems more or less to just be there to sort of uh, protect and look after uh, uh, evil Lynn. So they all get separated, right? And they all have to face these fears, right? Aren't really expounded upon what the fears are specifically, right? For example, it's not really expounded upon why. Or, or if it is, I missed it. Why Andra and Roboto and the beast man are in this uh basically basically like a zombie war zone right it looks like a battlefield where there's still bodies on the ground and they all come to life so i don't know if they were just going for like a generic scary holly uh, uh, uh halloween thing but i didn't see any sort of sig sig significance as to it's not like it picked out one person in that group and said you know this is your fear your fear is death your fear is dying in the battlefield, or, or whatever it is. The only one who really seemed to get a focus, a particular focus on their fears, obviously, 
uh, was Tila, which is understandable. She's the lead character, right? Uh, the focus is always going to be on them. So what happens is that she ends up uh, fighting both, because the whole thing about Skelly God is that he makes a deal with her, right? Let's make a deal, I'll make a deal, right? Uh, he will give her the half of the sword that's residing in Subternia in Hell if she will, you know, allow him to uh, feast on her feast on her fears. So <coughs> what happens is that she ends up fighting uh, two images. She fights an image of He-Man, not Adam, He-Man. And she fights an image of herself. It's the version of herself from the first episode in the in the white ceremonial garb, right? And they both represent uh, uh, a fear of hers, right? One fear, obviously, with He-Man is in relation to Adam, and the other fear is in relation to herself. The fear with Adam is that he didn't trust her, right? And uh, which I will admit does not make sense to me why especially since this is supposed to be years later. I don't know how many years later, but it's never stated, or if it is, I, I missed that part. But, uh, and here's the thing. I know some people are going to be like, well, Jean, she's facing her fears. Fears are irrational and fair enough. But even with that, it's like, why isn't she aware of the fact that he, that Adam didn't keep the secret about He-Man away from her and just her. After all, as she saw when when Duncan reported on his death towards the end of the first episode, the king didn't know. The king did not know. The only people in that room when when Duncan gets banished who knew were Duncan and Queen Marlena. So why in the world, years later, is she still of the opinion that Adam specifically kept it from her for a reason? I get they're trying to emphasize that they were best friends and everything, but it's like, when you know that his own dad didn't know, it'd be one thing if, like, literally everybody else knew, right? Like, Skeletor knew, like, like Evil Lynn knew, like, literally everybody else but her knew, and she was the only one left out. Then maybe I can understand it, but but the way it is, it's like, even if she's still angry or confused about why he didn't tell her, she should understand at this point that it wasn't really about her when he didn't tell his own dad, right? So again, I don't quite understand it, right? But she's able to uh, conquer this fear, and then the version where she fights herself in the white ceremonial garb, right, is supposed to be about her fear of the fact that um, she's not normal and she'll never be normal, right? She basically fears her own strength, her own power. Which I could perhaps understand to a certain degree if we saw her actually being powerful. All we get are just like, you know, ge generic fight scenes. I, I can't think of a scene yet where she's done something in a positive way that is exceptional. She hasn't made the save. She hasn't Really, she hasn't, like, saved the day in any major way. I think in each episode, um, it's really someone else saving the day. And in the first one, it's Adam, and he dies. Okay. In the second one, um, I guess maybe she kind of saved the uh, day, but the second episode was just so slow, right? And in the third episode, that was Man at Arms. Man, Man at Arms was the one saving the the uh, day in two instances and then in this one it's orko saving saving the uh, the uh, day so i really can't think of an instance in the show thus far and again we're we're one episode away from from the fifth episode where tila has really saved the day other people have saved her even in situations where she should be able to at least uh fight back Right, but I can't think of a situation where she rescued anybody. She has browbeat people, she's yelled and screamed, she's made everything about her, but I can't think of an instance where she's actually really helped anybody. <laughs> is basically it. Right, so she literally has a Captain Marvel moment when 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 she like embraces 
her power and she literally starts glowing and she literally does the whole like you know yeah type type thing it is it is it is so so silly and there's also a point where she literally tells Skelly God, right i'm your worst nightmare i'm like she they i know that that, that they try to put funny jokes and one-liners in in the show i haven't found the humor all that funny but uh um, I literally was, was was just like, really? She just she just actually said that line. Yeah, but okay, right. Her great, her biggest fears are that Adam didn't trust her. That's actually, I will admit that as much as I disagree with the writing on this, at least it's being consistent about that. That she's upset that Adam didn't trust her. I'll give them that. And then the other one is that oh. Uh, I'll, I'm not normal, right? Though there, uh, there has been another theme in 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 the show about her like hiding her uh, truth or or lying to herself. Uh, uh, Evil Lynn accuses her a few times in episodes two and three of like running away, running away from 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 her past and everything. So okay, there's some justification for for uh, He Man and herself to be her biggest fears in this in this idea of you know she's uh trying to be normal i still did disagree with that because we don't see her do anything normal and we don't see her actually help anybody who is relatively normal but okay at least there is some some not a lot but some storyline justification for for her fears being embodied by he he man and herself back when she was part of the uh Royal, Royal Guard. Okay, so I can tolerate that to a degree. And then we go on to um, uh, Evelyn and Orko, who have a su su surprisingly really touching moment. So they're in the uh, Academy of Magic, and Orko kind of explains his backstory. Right, He talks about how he was originally supposed to be named Oracle. His parents had big hopes for him, but He's more or less the the runt of the litter, uh, in with with his particular people, and everything has come difficult to him. So it's kind of like you know he's always been small. He's always been sort of underwhelming when when compared to others like him, right? So right, so, so instead of Oracle, he's always just been Orko. And they actually really do have this this very um, uh, touching conversation and. And Evil Lynn does seem to be uh, moved by it. So then this giant uh, monster comes up and starts attacking them in there. And they have to work together to survive. And there's this really nice part where uh, Evil Lynn sort of gets sideswiped uh, by the monster into like a, a bookcase or something. And you see that she's kind of injured and the monster's about to attack her. But Orko literally makes the diving save. Right? So it's it's really nice again again as it as it was in uh, in uh, episode three and in the first episode it continues to be the male characters who are the most heroic and not the women the women don't do much to be or to act in a heroic way we're supposed to view them as the heroes I guess because you know the protag the protag is always the hero but they don't really do anything heroic. In Evil Lynn's case, I understand. She's not a hero, she's the villainess. And she's in love with Skeletor. So obviously she's not going to do anything all that heroic. But, uh, again, Teela doesn't do anything heroic. Andra, her little buddy, doesn't do anything particularly uh, heroic. Though I will give her credit for at least not being a burden. Uh, I still don't know why Teela didn't tell her. Because this, this, this is so personal for Teela. Why she didn't tell Andra, who was never part of any of this that she couldn't come but at the very least Andra has been able to uh, to show that she can hold her own and she's not a burden I appreciate that <coughs> and then excuse me then the story goes to um, again the battlefield where uh, Andra and Ro Roboto and uh, the Beast Man are and they're just fighting zombies, right? It's nothing significant, really, in their interaction. It's kind of like, oh, we, we just need to just throw them somewhere, right? They have to just go do something. So they're having a generic fight. 
and um, they're about to be overpowered, right? There comes this uh, moment where um, everybody sort of beats their enemy at the same time and they overcome their, uh, their uh, fears. Tila overcomes her fears and, and she starts glowing like Captain Marvel or like uh, Ken at the end of the Street Fighter film when he finally breaks M. Bison's uh, uh, mind, mind con control. Like that, just as like white light around her. Of course, you know, she, she gets, you know, the whole, you know, holy white light. She hasn't done anything to deserve that, but she gets it because she's the protagonist. Right, but then uh, uh, she beats Skelegod and her her fears go away and then um, uh, Orko and uh, Evil Lynn use, uh, I guess, the last little bit of the magic orb or whatnot to defeat the monster that they're fighting and then um, Andra uses Ro Robato, she basically overloads him, blows him up um, to uh, kill the zombies, right? So <clears throat> that's how they win. They all beat their fears at the exact same time, and then they all sort of are are transported back to the same place, right? They regroup. Skelegod re reappears. Oh, sorry, no. What happens is that uh, Tila gets the sword. Tila gets the missing half of the sword, and then Evil Lynn comes to her. She notices the half of the sword, and she's like, "Give me that." And then Tila's like. Why am I going to give it to you? And and um, uh, Evil Lynn's like, I need that so that we can go to Preternia, right? So so they can go go get the other half of the sword. And uh, I'm just standing here watching, looking like, but how does she even know how to get to Preternia? Literally from hell. <laughs> but okay. So she takes the sword and, and, and she taps it against her uh, magic staff. So I'm guessing there's still some power in it. And it creates this door. It creates this, this door to Praternia, right? But then Skelegod uses the uh, floor to sort of like wrap, wrap their leg up so they can't actually escape. And that is when Orko gets his, you know, big sacrificial hero moment right he he explains that um he's not scared and 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 he creates like defensive shields and because skeleton tries to more or less make the ceiling collapse and like spikes like if you remember the uh, mystic cave level in sonic 2 in that boss fight where all the spikes are falling it's like that and uh you know he saves everyone basically right he stops the spikes from falling he attacks um Skelegod, and he puts up this large shield right and uh, he tells he he tells them he tells tila because 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 tila's like you know you have to you have to stop and uh he looks back at her and he's like don't worry about it i'm not scared anymore it really is a, a touching moment right and even even um, Evil Lynn is actually moved to try to help, right? And she aims her uh, staff, but she doesn't have enough strength, and her vision's kind of going blurry. And, and she she tries to, to sort of like assist him with magic, but she can't summon enough of it. So then um, Orko sacrifices himself. At least he goes out like a hero. Again, I can't say that he was built up in what about less than about of episode of that before he's killed he's introduced again in in episode three <laughs> and then he dies in episode four it's literally one episode you can't build up a character in one episode one movie perhaps yeah sure but you can't build a character up in 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 one episode especially when the episode isn't even really focused on them like like if it's a focus episode maybe but Orko didn't really have a focus episode. He had moments, focus moments in the episodes, but not a focus episode. So yeah, I mean, I wouldn't call this building him up because he's not in the story long enough to be built up. But again, the moments where he is in the story are, especially after the first episode, right? The moments when he's in the story really are um, touching and impactful and the 
the writing is actually really good uh, for that. The characterization of just, you know, this, this sickly little magic monster thing. Just wanting one more adventure be, before he dies and now he gets to, um, uh, <coughs> he gets to go out like, like a hero, right? He's like, you know, he was the runt of the litter and nobody ever thought he could do anything and now he's the one who, who saves the day. Now, uh, what's I'm looking for? Kevin Smith, as we all know, um, spoiled this, right? Right before the show aired, he spoiled the fact that Orko was going to die. And, we, uh, and he did it, he said himself that he did it to make fans angry. He's like, hey, I like that guy. Well, I can't speak for anybody else, but Orko's death doesn't make me angry. Orko's death makes me sad. I find it incredibly pointless, especially given the reasons why. Kevin Smith did it. Kevin Smith did it just to shock the fans, right? Ooh, this shocking death. He didn't do it uh, to actually advance the story in any way. He just put in a heroic sacrifice for Orko because he didn't like Orko. So, so if I'm mad about anything, it's that. But again, trying to put outside issues aside, Orko's sweet short life <laughs> was a very interesting, if uh, tragic one. Now, there is some rumors about the, that Kevin Smith might bring him back in the second part. I don't know. I'm not sure I'm going to watch the second part. I've literally gotten a fairly bad headache watching these episodes. So I'm not quite sure I want to put myself through that again with the second half, whenever that comes out. But, um, yeah, so Orko... Goes out a hero. The explosion from the magic blast uh, throws everybody into Preternia. And Tila, because Tila turns around to Evil Lynn and she says that it should have been her, right? She should have been one of the one to uh, die. Which, how do I put it? That's a very mean thing to say. But I can understand in that moment why Tila says that. Because she knew Orko, she was close to Orko, right? And Evil Lynn is evil, right? So I understand um, uh, Tila saying that to her in a moment of anger. What I don't understand is why she literally tries to start a fight in heaven. She literally talks about, she literally states that the alliance was a mistake and that she's going to rectify that and that she draws her sword. She was literally about to try to attack Evil Lynn, for literally no reason. Evil Lynn didn't kill Orko. Tila doesn't know of, of what they went through while they were in uh, uh, sub Subterranea because everybody was separated. And nobody talks about their experiences. It's, it's, it's not as if there's a scene where it's like, oh, I saw this, I went here, I, I went through that, I faced this. No, nobody knows what anyone else did. There is enough time for that. But Tila... Because she's Tila, and Kevin Smith apparently hates Tila. She literally is about to try to attack Evil Lynn for literally nothing. You have no proof that Evil Lynn is responsible for anything in as regards Orko's death. Her saying Evil Lynn should have died, I can understand that. Her attacking Evil Lynn, I don't. That made absolutely no sense. There's a rational anger, and then there's simply irrationality. And Tila is irrational. If everything up to this point has to confirm that this confirmed that the woman is simply irrational. Who the hell ever let her hold a sword? Who the hell ever gave her any type of weapon? Like, who the hell thinks that she was ready to be the freaking captain of the guard? let alone man-at-arms, if she is this quick to violent retribution over something that she could not prevent and that she has no proof Evil Lynn is in any way responsible for. Tila is just simply insane. She's a villainess. And the only reason we cannot call, this, call her the villain protag is because the series never presents her as the villain. We're supposed to believe that she's the heartbroken heroine. But in truth, she's the villain 
protagonist and she is just a violent nutcase. She is just a violent, emotionally manipulative, loony, flippin' toon. And the end of this episode proved it. Okay, now, here are my notes. I actually didn't take too many for this. I think it's just about a page. Let me see. Anything in the front? Oh, yeah. So it's just about a page or two. So here are my notes. Again, taken as the episode was going on. So, Tila is all alone in hell. <laughs> Why does Tila answer Skalagat's questions? Battle with He-Man. Tila is afraid He-Man Adam didn't trust her. Makes no sense because even King Randor didn't know. Of course, about Adam's secret. Maybe if Tila hadn't been mean to Man at Arms, he might have told her why he kept, or rather, why he couldn't share Adam's secret with her. That was something else that came to mind. Evil fear Tila, right? The version of herself from the ceremony that she fights. Makes no sense. Tila never makes an attempt to be normal. She doesn't help normal people. Tila is MCU Captain Marvel. She owns her power. Robato makes heroic sacrifice. Tila lectures Skelegod, but doesn't actually face defeat her fears. She literally says, I'm your worst nightmare. How does Evil Lynn even know how to find the second half, meaning the, the, the door to Paternia? Evil Lynn wanted to help Orko. Again, Tila is a bitch. She attacks Evil Lynn because Orko died. Lynn didn't kill him. All right, so those were my notes for the episode. Finally up to episode five after hours of this. And uh, yeah, we'll see. Well, we already know what happens at the end, but we'll see what, what happens prior to all that. So please let me know what you think, and I will see you all in the next one. Have a good day and night wherever you are.